Blessed Mother first. She who too was uh, wounded with love. She stood by the foot of the cross. And that crown of thorns turned into a crown of roses. We pray, remember, O oh most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was sin of him, that any one who fled to thy protection, implore thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired by his confidence, we fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To thee do we come, before thee we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy, hear and answer us. Amen. God, you who are all love, Draw us more deeply into love, no matter the cost, no matter the efforts, no matter the struggles. Draw us more deeply into love. May our hearts be more and more wounds of love, Lord, for you. And kindle in our hearts desire for you. Open our minds and hearts to show us how we can grow in this love of you. And from there, um, love and service of our neighbor. Ask all this in the holy and saving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 I don't know about you, but uh, the theme of the wound of love uh, excites me. It's one of the uh, awesome things that the mystics have picked up on and expanded upon. And it comes right from uh, the Song of Songs. I think that phrase shows up there twice in Song of Songs. I don't have the reference with me offhand, but um, the wounded love, wounded by the bridegroom's love. So Origen, the first major commentator on uh, the Song of Songs in the Christian tradition, he picks up this theme of wounded love. And from him, it just continues throughout the tradition. You can see it in the monastics. Uh, the Victorines, Richard of St. Victor, Hugh of St. Victor. We see it in St. Bernard of Clairvaux. We see it in John the Cross come to a special uh, completion and perfection in a way. Uh, and then continues on. We can also see like Mother Teresa's I Thirst. It's very much in the same spirit of this wound of love. Our thirst for God, God's thirst for us. And that's how the catechism begins, its section on prayer. With this theme of thirst, prayer is about um, the Samaritan woman going to the well. She's coming with her thirst, and she meets the Lord Jesus, who's thirsty for her, for her faith, for her love. So this theme of yearning uh, can be captured by thirst, but also by the wound of love. Uh, that longing, longing for the other, for the Lord. And so it's a very rich theme that opens before our eyes here. And so we'll just kind of enter a little bit into it, uh, this class today. And uh, so yeah, so first let's just think a little bit about this dynamic of desire. But one more thing, I guess the wound of love too. I mean, we, we won't speak about it in terms of desire, and kind of the dynamic of desire and the present bridegroom, the absent bridegroom, where have you hidden, beloved, and left me moaning? You fled like the stag after wounding me. I went out calling you, and you were gone. Right? That's the first stanza of John the Cross's uh, spiritual canticle, which I know you're working on memorizing. Uh, yeah, it's just, uh, <laughs> or it's just coming to you naturally, spontaneously. <laughs> Um, but yeah, in fact, so I might as well, I'll just go into this right away. All of the spiritual canticle, in a way, it's the poem, it's all about the wound of love. So the first stanza, it's there from the beginning. You know, like a good author, you tell your people what you're going to talk about in your introductory paragraph. So the first stanza, where have you hidden, beloved, and left me moaning? You fled like the stag after wounding me. I went out calling you, but you were gone. In the next 11 stanzas, 
into the 12th stanza, it's all about thirst, dying of love for the Lord, longing for him. We'll look at that more closely. And then as the uh, the stanzas continue, um, and they kind of return to this theme now and then. And then the last stanza of the original um, composition of it was Spiritual Canticle 35. Later he added five more stanzas, but originally it ended with 35. And uh, so listen to how it, it's, it ends. She lived in solitude, and now in solitude has built her nest. And in solitude he guides her, the Lord guides her, he alone, who also bears in solitude the wound of love. So you have spiritual candor, oh, it's all about the bride crying out, yearning for the bridegroom, being wounded with love for the bridegroom. And then as John brings this poem to an end, we see, ah, the bride is not the only one wounded with love. The bridegroom is wounded with love as well. He alone who also bears in solitude the wound of love. It's a beautiful way to bring that poem to a, a conclusion. Now, I'm very glad he added the next five stanzas and commented on those as well. Uh, but it's, it's nice to just savor that poetically, just a beautiful uh, ending to that and just the meaning behind that. We love because first God has loved us. We're wounded with love because God is first of all wounded with love for us. And we'll, we'll talk more, more about that as we get into things. The theme of wound of love, it, it captures something about desire, about love. But it also comes to culmination right on the cross, our wounded Savior. And so it captures too in our life, this life of desire, pursuing the Lord, that it's a crucified life as well. So that's why I think the Misty Edwards song captures so well. Arms extended uh, and love and our hearts are exposed. They're vulnerable. Um, and that can be painful at times. Sometimes we too are bleeding. Sometimes bleeding out of love. So this theme of wound of love, it captures, yeah, our crucified bridegroom with his saving wounds. Uh, his wounded hands, his wounded feet, his wounded side, his heart open, pierced for us, exposed uh, for us, bleeding out of love for us. And then all the difficulties that we face in our pursuit of the Lord. They're wounds of love being deepened, being brought to a, a greater fulfillment. And you'll, you'll come alive, right, when you learn to die. That's a beautiful line from the Misty Edward song. We'll come alive when we learn to die. That life of self-giving, self-emptying love for the other. Then we'll come alive, discover that the true meaning of life, true love, what it's all about. And we see that uh, in the crucified one. He gazes at us as we gaze back at him with our heart too, wounded with love. So this is the mystery we're kind of scratching the surface of today. I will just start with Origen, since he's kind of, at least on record, you know, the first writings that we have about this wound of love. So, you know, he was born 184, I think died like 254 or something. But he says in his prologue to the commentary on uh, the Song of Songs, he speaks about the wound of love. He says, so he brings up um, Cupid, right? So the old Greek, was he a god or something? Or just a hero, Cupid, the, um, you know, like Valentine's Day picks up on Cupid. Do you know the original setting? But it's part of Greek Greek mythology. So it's not just a, a modern uh, Valentine's Day card kind of thing. Um, but yeah, the idea is Cupid would wound the lover with the arrow and they'd be wounded with love, right? Um, and so yeah, it's so uh, Origen, you're writing in the second or third century, you know, picks up on this. So yeah, y'all just starting to read that. So he says, uh, well, but if this is how things stand... Uh, then just as one kind of desire is called flesh, fleshly, the desire that the poets call Cupid. And, you know, we get that word cupidity from that, which is like, um, um, what's the word? It starts with the C as well. The, um, 
concupiscence of the eyes of the heart. And so it's from Cupid, and it's from that Greek, or at least, you know, there's a Greek mythology, um, God the wounding, wounding others with love, with the arrow of it. This desire that the poets called Cupid, in accordance with which the person who desires sows to the flesh. So too there's a certain spiritual desire, in accordance with which that interior self, the true self, the one that desires sows to the spirit, Galatians 6, 8. And to speak more plainly, any who still bear the image of the earthly humanity in their outer self are driven by an earthly lust, an earthly love. But any who bear the image of the heavenly humanity in their interior self are driven by a heavenly uh, lust and love. It is, you know, so that word is probably eros here. And you might recall that Benedict XVI in his uh, God is Love, uh, Deus Caritas S, he has a whole reflection on agape and eros. Agape is the Greek word for the, the self-giving love of uh, charity. Eros is the word for the longing, the desire of love. And for a while, there were some Christians who would say, okay, Christianity is all about agape, uh, not about eros. Um, and then Benedict is sort of correcting that and saying, well, no, eros as purified, that longing, that desire as purified and elevated is even in God, uh, Benedict XVI says in Deus Caritas S. Um, so there is this yearning, or what Mother Teresa will call thirst. She even at one point says, you know, it's God's thirst. The thirst we see in the crucified one, it's God's thirst. He recognizes very mysterious because God is perfect. He doesn't need anything outside of him. Yet he is the God of love. So there is this eros that's perfected, that's cleansed of any imperfection, that's elevated, that isn't God. This heavenly desire, this yearning, this thirst, this wound being wounded and yearning for the other. So it's a deep mystery here. And we'll, we'll see it open up a little bit before our eyes as we go on for the next two hours. Uh, <laughs> or I guess probably more like an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> well, okay, break, hour and a half. <laughs> and we will be on time. This time. <laughs> So uh, those, okay, so those who bear the image of the heavenly man, 1 Corinthians 15, 49, in the interior self are driven by a heavenly eros in love. But the soul is driven by a heavenly desire in eros when it has detected the beauty and comeliness of the word of God and has been captivated by him and at his hand has received a certain dart and wound of desire. Right, so just like in Greek mythology, you would send Cupid to shoot somebody with an arrow that you wanted to fall in love with you. Uh, so the Lord our God, the word of God, shoots us with an arrow and wounds us with love, captivates us with his beauty, draws us to himself through desire. For this wound, for, okay, so, but the soul is driven by a heavenly desire and eros when it has detected the beauty and comeliness of the word of God and has been captivated by him. And at his hand has received a certain dart and wound of desire. And you read in Spiritual Canticle 31 from John of the Cross about the Lord God being captivated by us, which is strong language to think God being captivated by us. But John goes there. Um, and we'll, yeah, we'll open that up some, a little bit has been captivated by him, and at his hand has received a certain dart and wound of desire. For this word is the image and shining brightness of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, in whom all things are created, both things in heaven and things on earth, whether visible or invisible. Colossians 1.15, and so forth. Right, you know, any beauty we see in the world is but a pale reflection of, of God, the true beautiful one. So that's why what we saw in Spiritual Cant Canticle 7 about there are three kinds of wounds based on three kinds of knowledge of God or glimpses of God. Wounds caused by creaturely things, creaturely beauty. So think about that beautiful sunset that you see and it really can leave your heart aching. Aching for more. Aching for the infinite God. The infinite beauty. And then the second level of the wounds was the articles of faith. You're reading scripture, so you catch a glimpse of the Lord. And it captivates you. It wounds your heart with love, with desire for him. 
And then there's the third level of wound where God touches your soul beyond words and leaves you wounded with love, crying out to him. So yeah, every created thing, since you know the word is the word through whom all things were created, sort of the archetype that God the Father gazes into as, as he creates things. Um, and uh, so all created things, true creative beauty points us to the Lord. And the longing um, brought about in our hearts through created things directs us to the Lord, or it can, it should. So this is part of being wounded by the start of love from the word. If then one has the mental capacity, origin continues, to hold together in one's mind and to contemplate the loveliness and grace of all these things that have been created by the Lord, then struck by the elegant beauty and the magnificent splendor of the things themselves, and as the prophet says, pierced through by a chosen arrow, Isaiah 49, 2, one will receive from him the wound that is saving. Well, there's a salvific wound, a wound that's saving, and will burn with the blessed fire of the desire for God. One will receive from him the wound that is saving and will burn with the blessed fire of the desire for God. So John on the Cross picks up this theme of the wound of love also in Living Flame of Love, that burning of God's love, the burning of God's love in our soul. That can be afflictive at some, sometimes, but ends up being, being painless. So just consider the first two stanzas of the Living Flame of Love. O living flame of love that tenderly wounds my soul in its deepest center. Since now you are not oppressive, now consummate. If it be your will, tear through the veil of this sweet encounter. <clears throat> o sweet cautery, O delightful wound, O gentle hand, O delicate touch that taste of eternal life and pays every debt. In killing, you change death to life. In other words, right, we come alive when we learn to die, to die to ourselves, to die to our egoism. Um, and so, yeah, it's just really striking how this theme of the wound of love is very central to John the Cross. It shows up in all these different ways. In this living flame of love that burns, that wounds my soul in its deepest center, is another expression of it. And it begins as being oppressive, because we're not used to it. Um, living flame, I think it's 123. He says, you know, the very love that begins as being afflictive and oppressive to us, it's that so because our wills are dry and arid, our wills are weak, and this, this uh, living flame is there's a fullness to it. There's an abundance to it. I'll just go to it. This is Living Flame 123. I have it in my hand. I might as well just read from it. So, um, yeah, okay. So, the flame of itself is extremely loving. And the will of itself is excessively dry and hard. Right, when we begin, it, when we begin in the spiritual life, but the Lord transforms us more and more. So we resemble this living flame of love. When the flame tenderly and lovingly assails the will, hardness is felt beside the tenderness and dryness beside the love. The will does not feel the love and tenderness of the flame since because of its contrary hardness and dryness, it is unprepared for this until the love and tenderness of God expel the dryness and hardness and reign within it. Accordingly, this flame was oppressive to the will, making it fill and suffer its own hardness and dryness. Right, so John the Cross, he's given the deeper underlying meaning of the dark night of the soul and the afflictions that we experience in the life of prayer, the dryness we feel in our heart and our, our wills. In, in these cases, it's actually, it's God's living flame of love taking over more and more our souls, but we're not ready for it. We're not prepared for it. And so it's painful. It's afflictive. Uh, but it's God's gentle love there that's burning. But because of original sin, because of our own sin, um, we're sort of the opposite. And so we feel more our own kind of contrariness to it uh, than to the, the delightful love that it is in itself. Um, so when it takes that transformation, so John continues, because this flame is immense and far-reaching and the will is narrow and restricted, 
right? We're a little too much turned in on ourselves, too self-centered, too kind of self-focused. And the Lord um, tries us, he purifies us uh, with these afflictive trials uh, to help us to turn outside of ourselves to others. Because this flame is immense and far-reaching and the will is narrow and restricted, the will fills its confinement and narrowness in the measure that the flame attacks it. It fills this until the flame penetrating within it enlarges, widens, and makes it capable of receiving the flame itself. Because this flame is savory and sweet and the will possesses a spiritual palate, uh, disturbed by the humors of inordinate affections, the flame is unpleasant and bitter to it, and the will cannot taste the sweet food of God's love. And in this fashion, it fills distress and distastefulness besides so ample and delightful a flame of love. The will does not experience the savor of the flame because it does not fill this flame within itself. It only fills what it does have within itself, its own misery. <laughs> So it's just to say in the middle of the trial to be like, yeah, this is God's love, having his work, work, doing his work in me, having his way with me. And to, in faith, be able to grasp that. Uh, this furnace that you're in, it's, it's the furnace of God's love. And it feels afflictive. But that's because our hearts aren't ready for it yet. And so uh, Hadowick of Antwerp, um, the Beguine that we'll be looking at next month at the Midday Retreat with the Mystics, she has a lot on this. To be able to recognize God who is love, min, I guess is the word, it's um, um, Flemish, I guess, uh, min, love, to find love in all of it. Love comes in all these surprising ways, in ways that we wouldn't call love at first, because <laughs> of our experience of it. Uh, these trials, um, it's love, it's love working in us, having its way with us. So, O oh, living flame of love that tenderly wounds my soul in its deepest center, since now you are not oppressive, now consummate if it be your will. Tear through the veil of the sweet encounter. So the wound of love captures something of this pain of purification. But on the other hand, once we are brought into a deeper union with the Lord, with the Lord something of the wound of love remains because desire remains. O oh, sweet cautery, O oh, delightful wound. Right, so this wound of love becomes a delightful wound. We wouldn't want it otherwise. And we do kind of have that experience, you know, with longing. Uh, let's say, you know, the beautiful sunset, that ache. Uh, there's something painful about it, but there's also something savory about it. We wouldn't want it otherwise. And so that's the mystery of this wound of love, of, of desire, of the desire of love. St. John of the Cross you know, he even says that this wound of love continues into heaven. We'll, we'll look at this more closely because it is a, a deep mystery how in heaven we're at rest because we're resting on our final good. We're seeing God face to face, yet there's still desire. And so we'll see how different um, mystics have, have spoken about this. But um, so St. John of the Cross says, Living Flame 1, number 14. When the soul asserts that the flame of love wounds it in its deepest center, it means that insofar as this flame reaches its substance, power, and strength, the Holy Spirit assails and wounds it. It does not make such an assertion to indicate that this wounding is as essential and integral as in the beatific vision of the next life. <laughs> right, so there's a wounding that happens now. Uh, but there's a wounding in the next life that's much more essential and integral. So this wounding that he's talking about during this life in this poem, it, it's not, this wounding, it does not make such an assertion to indicate that this wounding is as essential and integral as in the beatific vision of the next life. Um, so there is something in the next life that is a wound of love, but yet all the pain is kind of taken away. But it is integral and essential. It's just the, the nature of love. So St. Catherine of Siena will describe it this way. Um, sat, satisfaction without boredom. Um, she uses three phrases in describing eternal life, the beatific vision. Satisfaction without boredom. Hunger without pain. And so there's this yearning, but without the pain. 
Uh, and then one other, I forget, but she's, um, she's quoting who she thinks is Augustine, but it's pseudo-Augustine. Augustine's an evil twin. No. He <laughs> was an evil twin. <laughs> so, uh, pseudo-Augustine, someone who they thought was Saint, you know, they thought were Saint Augustine. But anyways, but we'll, we'll talk more about how different saints talk about this, this fulfillment of the wound of love that persists even in heaven. Um, but in a way that's restful. Uh, but in a way that's still yearning and striving. So it's a great, a great mystery. I mean, why, why would we su- be surprised that there'd be such a great mystery about our union with God for all eternity, right? So that's this. Of course, it's going to be a mystery here. So then it also opens up. Well, okay, well, if the blessed in heaven enjoy this this wound of love, um, then God too. If the perfection that the saints have in heaven involves this wound of love, it makes more sense to speak about God having it. Uh, But more on that later. So, yeah, oh sweet cautery, oh delightful wound, oh gentle hand, oh delicate touch that tastes of eternal life and pays every debt. In killing, you change death to life. You'll come alive when you learn to die. To die with the Lord on the cross, hearts, uh, arms wide open, and love, heart exposed, bleeding, sometimes bleeding. That's how we'll come alive, alive in love, the love of the Lord, self-giving love, self-emptying love. I'll go to this now. I was going to talk about it later, but we'll just do it now. Um, so wounds of love. There are many ways that we are wounded. This is an important topic for today because we often, we talk a lot more about um, like psychological woundedness, interior wounds, father wounds, um, things like that. And it's a, a great, um, great thing that we have a better awareness of these things and to seek healing in these ways. But I think sometimes um, people can have a, wrong idea of what the healing is going to look like. And so the psychological healing, does the Lord touching our wounds from the past um, and healing them, does that mean like we're now like independent, we can stand our own two feet, we're not needy for anything, we have it all together? Um, uh, no. That we're self-sufficient, does the Lord want to, does our healing really make us self-sufficient? Um, no. No. But I think people kind of can expect that when they're, you know, sometimes people are they're, they're like keep seeking healing, but they they think they're never healed. Mm-hmm. But it could be the case that the healing that they're after isn't really the healing the Lord wants to give them. Mm-hmm. Right? The Lord wants to heal the wounds that get in the way of our loving. Right? Those are the wounds that the Lord wants to heal. You know, fearfulness, fear that was maybe engendered in kind of ways we were treated in the past or something. Fears that then get in the way of our loving. You know, those wounds he does want to heal, to bring to a whole wholeness so that we, so we can love more freely. But wounds that kind of leave us desperate for him, you know, wounds that push us to the Lord more and more, to be desperate for him, does he want to heal those wounds? Oh, why would he? <laughs> it's good to be desperate for the Lord. And our neediness and our, our aching as it drives us to the Lord, like that's a good thing. And so don't expect like healing that's going to get rid of that. I mean, why would you want that? <laughs> Unless you want to be like self-sufficient and have it all together and not be yearning in your heart anymore. Uh, yeah. What would examples of those be, Father? Yeah, okay. Okay, so let's say, um, yeah, okay, so yeah, let's say like a, a father wound. Mm-hmm. Let's say um, your father treated you poorly or, you, you, or you, you just felt it that way or you felt kind of abandoned from your father. Father seems a little distant. And so there's something in you that, that cries out uh, in that neediness of being abandoned, you're crying out for him, and there's something in your heart that keeps crying out. Um, so that, and then you're, there's some fearfulness, you know, lack of trust that was created from that father wound. 
Um, so then like that fearfulness, things that get in the way of love, okay, the Lord does want to heal you from, but that like crying out, that yearning, um, I think the Lord wants to elevate it. He wants to um, shape it. He wants to turn it to him. He wants to supernaturalize it. So the, the good news that we have in John the Cross is that whatever the source of your woundedness, so it could be our own sin, that's the cause of our woundedness. It can be uh, things that were inflicted on us outside of our control, you know, childhood wounds, things like that. Whatever the source of the, the wound, the Holy Spirit can transform it into a wound of love. And so he's working with the, that imagery of cauterizing. The Holy Spirit cauterizes the wounds. So, you know, it's kind of the old medicine, the old science. You, you, I guess it's still used um, to cauterize the, the wound, to heal it. And so he's saying the Holy Spirit can cauterize our wounds, whatever they are, and transform them into wounds of love. And we can see how that's the case. You're left with a, a longing for like a father figure in your life. And the Holy Spirit transforms that. He cauterizes that wound into a wound of love. So you're, you're crying out, you're yearning for God the Father in your heart. It's interesting, uh, Mother Teresa... She lost her father at an early age, maybe two or three, or maybe she was probably a little older. You know, certainly in, in her, you know, by 10 or 11, she lost her father. I, who did I just read about? Um, someone uh, lost her father. Oh, it's, oh, John of the Cross. John of the Cross lost his father at age two. And so to think about that, that could have not but affected him. And left what we would call like a father wound in sorry, It could have not but affected him in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, these saints, there are many more examples for people who kind of like can't get beyond, like they think they have this father wound and so they're ruined for the rest of their life. Uh, and like they, they can't get beyond it and they kind of um, define themselves in terms of the, this lack and what they're not capable of because of this father wound. And it's like, well, no, look at these saints, Mother Teresa, St. John of the Cross, Look how that father wound was transformed for a greater love for the Lord and longing for the Lord. So there are great signs of hope. Um, and so, yeah, to, you know, to seek healing in these ways, but to recognize, yeah, what, what kind of healing the Lord wants to give us and what kind he doesn't want to give us. He wants us longing for him, crying out for him. And it's for our good that we do that, so that we desire him more. And he's enough to fill these lacks, these voids. It's good to be desperate for the Lord. So insofar as these wounds push us to be desperate for the Lord, you know, they're transformed into wounds of love. Yeah. In regards to, like, um, like the crying out and the yearning for God, which you've recognized is, like, the result of a past wound, but, like, you, it's, you're not, what I'm hearing from you is, is you're not asking for healing. So, like, how do you bring that need to him? Like, do you ask for healing, or what, like, what do you ask for there? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I would say um, you ask for healing, but you recognize healing as the solus. Uh, so solus in Latin is, is, is healing, and it's, you know, it's salvation. And so the healing the Lord wants to bring you is your, your full salvation. Mm-hmm. And you're yearning for him in freedom. I mean, the wounds that make, you know, make us live in fear, those wounds don't free us. Uh, th- those wounds prevent us from loving and freedom. Or, you know, trusting other people, those wounds hold us back from trusting. Those kind of wounds, yeah, the Lord wants to heal. Um, and then, um, yeah, he wants us to love in freedom. In freedom of spirit. So any wounds that prevent us from being free, um, he wants to heal us from. Yeah, so how do we, okay, so back to your question. No, I, I think you ask for these healings, um, but you, you recognize what the healing is not going to look like and, but, and what it is going to look like. I don't, anybody, any other ideas on that? But that's a good question. Yeah, but what do we pray for then? Because no, I think we still should be praying for. Yeah. It reminds me of St. Paul, just like the three, they never name what it is, but how you get out of it. Yeah. Didn't seem like he ever got it, but maybe it was, I don't know, something that... Yep, yeah, the thorn in the flesh, Second yeah, Corinthians 12. 
words. Yeah, so he's... Um, so we could say, okay, he, he asked three times, which means he asked many times to be delivered of this Thor and it never happened. And so we could say, okay, well, he should have not just prayed for it since he didn't gr- get it granted anyways. Uh, but what's the reality of the situation? Him crying out for the thorn to be removed, it did bring him to a new place to, that, to be able to say, your, my, your grace is sufficient for me, for power is made perfect in weakness. So it's good that he cried out for that healing and kept doing it, and the Lord did bring him to a new place through that desire, through that yearning. Uh, but it was different than what he first expected, just having the thorn removed. And so it brought him to that place. Yeah, that's a perfect example. My grace is sufficient for power is made perfect in weakness. You know, be desperate for me, the Lord is saying. Cast yourself on me because grace, you know, because power is made perfect in your weakness. Uh, and so it was a transformative process for Paul to kind of go through that, that yearning and seeking, you know, having the church of Ephesus pray over him at prayer meetings, uh, asking for healing or whatever form it took. Um, or, you know, probably the first Corinthians, right? Chapter 14, uh, those kind of, wild prayer meetings they were having uh, with <laughs> prophetic words and, and so forth. You know, the first Corinthian, the church of Corinth praying over Paul, asking for these healings and this thorn to be removed. You know, God did what he wanted with that. And it's probably different than, it's different than Paul expected, different than just removing the pain and the, the lack, the weakness it left in him because power is made perfect in weakness. So I don't know, maybe, so yeah, we pray for healing for these things, but Lord, in the way that you want to heal me, in the way that you want to bring me the fullness of solace, the fullness of health, the fullness of salvation. And that's going to involve a wound of love, a longing for him. Yeah, any other ideas on this? Just um, something that um, Andrew and I came up against firsthand in recent weeks was just kind of like this, this prayer of, I don't know. And it's so hard for us is like wanting to be in control all the time, New Yorkers, to pray that prayer of, I don't know, but it's like, I don't have the answer. Lord, I'm just bringing this to you. I don't have the answer. I know you have the answer. And getting it answered. So you don't have to know. You can just bring it to the Lord, whether it's a feeling or a word or whatever, and just say, I'm handing this over to you and wait for the response. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. That's what John the Cross is in Spiritual Canticle 2. He looks to Mary at Cana, mm-hmm. Our Lady at Cana. She doesn't say, Lord, do this or do that. He, he, she just brings before the Lord the need. Yeah. Son, they have no wine. Yeah. Uh, they have no wine. Uh, <laughs> uh, and just that open longing and the Lord can fill it as he wants to fill it. So, um, you know, I think it's good to have particular intentions and to bring this or that area in your heart or situation yeah you know to look at you know the specifics of these wounds um you know your relationship with your father or whoever it was or and to you know get into the nitty-gritty and specifics of that and ask for it in a specific way but to end uh, with kind of yeah what's karen is is suggesting you know uh, but yeah we don't we bring it and we don't know how the lord wants to um heal it or how he wants to to use that or how he wants to answer that prayer um so yeah, it's kind of a, a both and uh, there. Um, yeah, but we should always, uh, you know, just like the Lord in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, He states His desire in a very you know clear way: "Let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but Thy will." And so He ends with that openness to whatever the Lord wants to do. Yeah. And it seems like this would also be a time that you know, you're putting your desire before the Lord, and all of the cardinal virtues would increase within this time. So just believing, all right, Lord, I know you can heal me. I know you will heal me in some way. Um, so increasing faith, increasing hope, increasing love. Um, throughout that time, recognizing, God, you can do this. Yeah, you can heal me in whatever way. Um, but putting it completely on the Father and being a child with open hands. Yeah, knowing it can be provided for you. It doesn't necessarily mean that it will, but if it's the Lord's will, it will be. Um, yeah, so it seems that the virtues would be a way just, or a reason to open up your hands. Um, and the healing could be through an increase in faith or an increase in hope. Yeah, exactly. No, that's good. That's right.
yeah, faith reaches out into the darkness. Uh, hope reaches out with empty hands. Um, and even if kind of that that hope is is tied to a particular thing, but to yet yeah, leave it kind of open ended at the end, um, allows the Lord to work as He wants to, and allows us to recognize how the Lord has worked, rather than you know walking away from the prayer and you're still limping, your knee still hurts, uh, <laughs> you're praying for healing for your knee or something, um, to recognize, oh, the Lord may be doing something deeper in your heart uh, through an increase of faith, hope, and charity, theological virtues, and to um, that deeper, yeah, that's the more important thing. Um, he doesn't, the Lord isn't so concerned to, to heal us physically all the time, it seems, or he's not so concerned to heal us psychologically, emotionally sometimes either, if it can be used in a deeper way. And uh, this wound of love that makes us more and more dependent upon him. My power is made perfect in weakness. Because it's certainly, it's very interesting, right? The Lord Jesus, he suffered the wounds of the cross. And he could have easily risen from the dead without the wounds. Right? You know, he could have risen with his all his wounds healed. Um, but he didn't. He came still bearing those those wounds, those wounds of love. But now these wounds of love are glorified. They're radiating beauty, glory, God's love, God's life. And so that says a lot as we think about our woundedness, to think about uh, the wounded Christ and how those wounds remain in his glorified body. So our, our wounds, you have to get into the details about them and bring that before the Lord. Because that, that is important for kind of the, the healing process to be freed from what keeps us from loving fully, to look at these things in the faith, in the face and concretely in all the details, and to do it with peace, trust in the Lord, and then to hand all that over to the Lord and let him do as he wills with you and with it, what you're praying for. So John the Cross in the same section, you know, the Holy Spirit, he, any wounds, whatever they're caused, the Holy Spirit can transform uh, into the wounds of, into a wound of love, the cauterizing effect of the Holy Spirit. And John the Cross points out that the healthy lover is the wounded lover, right? The healthy lover is not the one who's like, I'm self-sufficient, I don't need you, uh, I'm perfectly healthy and secure in myself. Uh, the healthy lover is the desperate lover, the wounded lover. You know, I need you. I need you, Lord. Um, that's the healthy lover. It's the wounded lover. So this is all from Living Flame of Love, stanza two, number seven. And like, you know, we saw in uh, Living Flame 114, something of that wound of love is essential and integral to the beatific vision. <laughs> and so he doesn't want to do away with it entirely. And if I may, not even just that, uh, that's it's not saying it strongly enough. There's something essential and integral to love about this wound of love that will remain even into the beatific vision. So St. Bernard, Sermon 84, beginning of Sermon 84, night long in my little bed, I sought the Lord whom my soul loves. I sought him whom my soul loves. It is a great good to seek God. In my opinion, the soul knows no greater blessing than to seek God. It is the first of its gifts in the final stage in its process. It is the first of its gifts in the final stage in its progress, seeking the Lord. It is inferior to none, and it yields place to none. What could be superior to it when nothing has a higher place? What could claim a higher place when it is the consummation of all things, seeking the Lord? What virtue can be attributed to anyone who does not seek God? What boundary can be set for anyone who does seek him? Right? We never reach the end in seeking God. We find just to seek more. To come to that new place of a new beginning. To seek more of the Lord. The psalmist hence says, seek his face always. 
nor I think will a soul cease to seek him, even when it has found him. It is not with the steps of the feet that God is sought, but with the heart's desire. And when the soul happily finds him, its desire is not quenched, but kindled. Does the consummation of joy bring about the consuming of desire? Rather, it is oil poured upon the flames. So it is. Joy will be fulfilled, but there will be no end to desire, and therefore no end to the search. Think, if you can, of this eagerness to see God, as not caused by his absence, for he is always present. And think of the desire for God as without fear or failure, for grace is abundantly present to help us in the search. So yeah, when the seeking of the Lord is consummated, it's like oil poured onto the fire. The fire leaps up all the more through that union of love with the Lord. He says um, in his treatise on loving God, chapter four, he says in heaven, there's, there's, yeah, okay, so on loving God, chapter four, there's no satiety, rather an ever-increasing appetite. Then he says, an eternal and infinite desire, which knows no want. That's chapter 10 of On Loving God. An eternal and infinite desire, which knows no want, no lack. So that, you know, that's kind of the paradox. It's a desire, but a desire that's fulfilled at the same time. That's the paradox of, of heaven. Rest, but still movement. Um, be still and still moving. That's how T.S. Eliot ends um, the four quartets, or one of the parts of that. Um, be still and still moving. So the kind of that moving and stillness, that rest and, and movement. Or as Bernard puts it here, an eternal and infinite desire which knows no want. You know, it's that satisfaction, it's that hunger without pain. Uh, he says in chapter 14, love is never without desire. Of uh, This is on, on loving God, that treatise. Okay, yeah. There's a, I was just thinking, um, John of the Cross had something in Living Flame of Love that I was, that connects com- like perfectly with that statement that I was thinking about for like a long time praying with. Um, when talking about like the fire and how he talks about how the fire like penetrates the wood and transforms it and like unites it with itself and so the fire grows hotter and hotter and that will like create this like spark um, and there's this incandescent like inflamed flares up and shoots out like the flame from itself. And so just thinking about that and how that also connects with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. No. Yeah, it really does. <laughs> it really does. Yeah. Um, I didn't write down where it was from, but it's from looking flame somewhere. Yeah, right. No, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think it's um, four. Yeah. Yeah, it stands at four. Yeah, yeah, towards the end there. You know, so he says, sometimes the love in our soul, even with someone in, in spiritual perfection in this life, sometimes it's like the glowing embers, yeah. Yeah. but sometimes the flame leaps up. So even when you don't feel the flame leaping up, you know, the, the love is still there, but the, the glowing embers. Um, but, you know, leaping up is, is nice. <laughs> <laughs> so just, I mean, just to give, I mean, the whole, so Gregor of Nyssa um, really emphasizes kind of this, the seeking always continues and, and even into the next life, into heaven, because you're seeking the infinite. And we never fully comprehend God. And so it's often, you know, kind of painted this way. You know, he stresses that. And then like St. Thomas Aquinas, he stresses more eternal beatitude. You're at rest because you, you, you're in that perfect union with, with the good. And so your soul is at rest. And so sometimes they're kind of, people can try to pit them against each other. Oh, St. Thomas has this view of eternity and eternal beatitude as eternal rest and then for Gregor of Nyssa, it's this continuous, continually seeking um, into the infinite good. But you know, in reality, I think the two come together. And it is this kind of mysterious paradox how they're, they're both there. 
And you can't find it Thomas. You know, Thomas recognizes that God is always beyond us. So there always is kind of the, this newness, kind of this, this reaching out for more. And there are, are passages from Gregory of Nyssa that recognize that um, it is rest as well in, in eternity. Uh, it's not a restless seeking that happens in eternity for the infinite. And so Augustine, too, he's often seen as emphasizing the rest. Right at the end of the City of God, he says um, about heaven, there we will rest and praise. We will praise and love. Uh, we will, will love and uh, delight or something. Um, but even in Augustine, there's something more about the seeking more. So um, his commentary on Psalm 63, indeed, God is always greater, however much we grow. You know, there's always more. The Catechism quotes that um, and with the phrase, the ever greater God, on a, a passage about adoration. It quotes St. Augustine here. But the St. Augustine also says on Psalm 119, if that which is loved without a change of affection is rightly said to be sought after, um, and that even in heaven will always seek thy statutes, that is the truth of God. Right, so in heaven, there, there will still, still be the seeking after the truth of God, Augustine says. Augustine, who emphasizes you know, the restfulness of, of eternity. Um, uh, I could, it's kind of a sidetrack, but I don't want to miss this point. Hilary of, of uh, Portier. Um, he says, the more the infinite created spirit, right? Because our own spirits are infinite in a way, infinite in their capacity to grow mm -hmm. and infinite open to kind of all things in a way. The more the infinite created spirit would endeavor to encompass God to any degree, the more the infinity of a measurelessness, the more the infinite created spirit would endeavor to encompass God to any degree, the more the infinity of a measureless eternity would surpass the entire infinity of the nature that pursues it, the created infinity. So you were always being surpassed by the more of God. And that entails something of a desire for more, uh, longing for more. Blessed John Roosbrook puts it this way, always hungering and always satisfied. Anyway, we could say more about that, but just a little taste, because I want to do one more thing. Um, ah, okay, I, I'll just... <laughs> <laughs> this is from uh, the Carthusians. Um, they have a book called Wound of Love, which is a collection of essays and homilies. Mm -hmm. So this is um, an essay called uh, To Create is to Forget. So being brought into the newness of the Lord, it also kind of entails forgetting the past to create that something or to, to be open to the new thing that God has created in our lives. Uh, he says, union with God comes to us as a perpetual novelty, a beginning ever renewed. And so that union with God, there's always a newness to it, a beginning ever renewed. This spiritual going beyond oneself is not a particular stage of the spiritual life. It is the actual condition of our existence. Right, as creatures, as creatures with an infinite capacity, uh, like uh, Hilary of Poitiers was pointing at. The spiritual going beyond oneself is not a particular stage of the spiritual life. It is the actual condition of our existence. The spirit, our spirit, as an immaterial and intelligible reality, is of itself unlimited. In this regard, God and the soul resemble each other. And then he quotes Gregory of Nyssa here. But then he continues, the, the created being can always become greater. If God is infinite in reality, the soul is infinite in potential. It's the soul's divinity, or its share in the divinity, consists in tra transforming itself into God, being transformed into God. If it, is, it, if it is infinite in potential, its creation must take the form of a process of growth without which it would be simply finite in the way that the natural world is, material world is. In this perspective, continual progress is constitutive of the soul itself. In this perspective, continual progress is constitutive of the soul itself. 
and it keeps itself constantly oriented towards something higher than itself. So he speaks of existence as a created spirit capable of unlimited growth and knowledge and love. Then he goes on to speak of eternity. Each present moment leaks, links me with eternity, carries me in the Son towards the Father and the love of the Holy Spirit. The most dazzling light, the most intense experience of love, the greatest possible revelation of God's beauty. Not even these things are the one who is infinite, incomprehensible, always beyond us. To find him, therefore, I must always go higher in order to encounter his unending newness. To reach the creator, I must make myself a creator, at least insofar as my dispositions are concerned. I must break all the molds in which I constantly fashion myself, for they are invariably restrictive. I must reject all securities, all familiar words, all riches, so as to offer myself utterly poor, and virginal to the breath of the Spirit. All right, so there's always a newness, always going more, which means we have to kind of move on from where we were, which means to come alive, we have to learn to die um, to the former things, always reaching out for more, the newness of the Lord. And he says, you know, about different situations that first strike us as something is going wrong. It's actually part of God's process of refashioning us. What do we know? When the words exceed our understanding, when the melody is halting, unexpected, or full of half tones, it's actually ourselves breaking free from our limits and rising above ourselves. So St. Gregory of Nyssa says in um, Sermon 6 on Song of Songs, in a sense then, the latter creation is continually being created growing by its augmentation in the good, in such a way that no limit can be circumscribed by any, any limit. And yet the actual good, even if it appears the greatest and most perfect possible, is never anything but the beginning of a superior good. That by ecstasy reaching out towards what is ahead, the things which had formerly appeared uh, fall into oblivion. So St. Gregory Nessa says we go from beginning to beginning, to new beginning, in the pursuit of the infinite. And something of that continues into heaven. Something of that wound of love, that longing for more, that desire uh, that's enkindled when oil is poured upon it in that union. Uh, something of that continues, though, without pain and while being in rest and at peace in the Lord. Be still and still moving. And in the midst of that, we encounter more and more profoundly, right, what Augustine says, a beauty ever ancient. All right, does he leave it there? No. Beauty ever ancient, a beauty ever new. And so to be, uh, look forward to that place in heaven, pure satisfaction, but, but no boredom. So that's what we look for. That's where the wound of love in this life, too, is helping us to enter into that movement and, and to get us there. And so we'll, we'll call it quits here for now and then I'll come back after our break. Thank you.